Welcome, everyone. So we are fortunate to be in the greatest ecosystem in the world for understanding and exploiting the chemistry that underlies biological systems and biological processes. In that context, in 2019, uh, Amit Chudari and Bridget Wagner and Laura Kiesling and I reached across Main Street to set up this seminar series uh, to bring to Kendall Square uh, some of the world's greatest chemical biologists. And after a two-year hiatus, we're back online, back live again, I should say, um, and here's our lineup for the coming academic year, and I think you'll all agree that this is uh, a fantastic uh, group of chemical biologists, and I urge you all to uh, come to um, all of these seminars, which will occur approximately once a month. Now, this venue is a little bit unusual. Most of the seminars will be in the Broad Auditorium across Main Street, but we wanted to give uh, today's speaker a uh, home court advantage. Uh, so we're, we scheduled this first one here um, on the MIT campus in 10 to 50. I want to say too that we're grateful for uh, financial support uh, from these generous corporate sponsors who um, contribute enormously to the vitality of the Kendall Square ecosystem and we're happy to have them as uh, part of the team. We're also grateful to the Broad Institute and to uh, the MIT Chemistry Department uh, for financial support. Um, that's what I wanted to say to introduce the series. I'm going to now pass the uh, microphone to uh, Bridget Wagner, who will introduce uh, today's speaker. Thanks, Ron. It's uh, my distinct honor and my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this rebirth of the new series, Laura Kiesling. Um, I think you all know her, but I'll, I'll do a little justice for her introduction. Um, ever since 2017, the Cambridge community has been benefited from the presence and the arrival of Dr. Kiesling, um, and who came to us from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she has a, a very long list of awards and prizes, probably as many as I have papers, if not more, so I won't reiterate all of them, I'll just highlight a few. She was a MacArthur Fellow in 1999, the winner of a Tetrahedron Prize, as well as one of the youngest inductees into the National Academy of Science. And, and she's been a real pioneer in the area of carbohydrate chemical biology. And I know I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing the latest from her lab. On a personal note, Laura is a, a very strong mentor, especially for women in science, and she's uh, obviously a top-notch scientist. Some of the things that inspire me about her are her ability to balance scientific rigor and appropriate skepticism with an immense kindness and, and mentorship, as well as seeming to have an infinite amount of energy, both physical and mental, and uh, really feels like it puts, it puts me to shame for sure, and so she's a, a real inspiration to us all. Um, so with that, thank you again for being our first speaker. We're gonna hear about protein glycan interactions and immunity. Laura Kiesling. Um, thanks for that introduction, Bridget, and thanks for introducing the series, Ron. It's really um, cool to be here in 10250. I think this is the first lecture I've ever given here. I've certainly been to a lot of lectures here. And um, Ron and I were talking about this, and he reminded me of this occasion um, when I was, I think, a, a postdoc maybe, or just starting my career, and I was skiing. Um, and this guy who was about, I don't know, 25 or 35, 30 years older than I you know, uh, was at the time, came up to me and said, excuse me, does 10 to 50 mean anything to you? <laughs> and I realized at the time I was wearing my MIT class ring. And so he was an MIT grad. After I said, yes, it's a lecture hall at MIT, he then proceeded to introduce himself, introduce me to his entire family, so we all bonded, and so I guess for those of you who are at MIT or affiliated with MIT in some way, let me just point out, you cannot escape. <laughs> it's going to be yours. 
Okay, so um, this is very intimidating just even to look at all these great people and to look out in the audience at people from my lab and friends and people that I know and care about. So um, I was excited to tell you about um, some new data from our lab, but I thought I would also give some context for how the projects developed because, again, we have a lot of new students who, um, who I can talk with and show how ideas developed in the lab. So, um, the project I'm going to tell you about involves uh, protein-carbohydrate interactions in immune recognition. And I think everybody who knows me knows that I love carbohydrates. Um, I especially like the ones on the outside of the cell. And we are interested in all different aspects of uh, carbohydrate chemistry and biology. Today, I'm going to focus on understanding and exploiting uh, protein recognition of extracellular carbohydrates and the idea that glycans are basically kind of the face of the cell. They're involved in cell-cell recognition or um, in the case of, of, for example, viruses, they're involved in recognition. So. Um, I think that when I really first started thinking about sugars and looking at their binding constants, it made me wonder whether they were important at all. Because you know, when we think about biological interactions, we usually think about high affinity interactions. If you want to make a drug, you don't want to make something that has a millimolar binding affinity. And if you look at the role of glycans in biology, and you look at single protein carbohydrate interactions, they're really, really weak. And so I'll, let me give you uh, a number of them. Influenza virus invades us by binding to sialic acid residues on our cell surface. And the way this sialic acid is linked to a galactose here determines tropism of the virus. So it determines whether or not um, the virus can infect humans or only other uh, animals. Antigen uptake, so the recognition of foreign um, agents in us is mediated by proteins that recognize carbohydrates. This one can occur on the surface of HIV, and it's recognized by this protein DC sign. And you can see the complexity of this carbohydrate, but yet the binding constant is quite weak. And um, protein carbohydrate interactions are also critical in inflammation. They mediate the targeting of white blood cells um, to sites of tissue damage. And again, if you look at these interactions on an individual basis, they're weak. And so I think um, many of you recognize that the way that these function is through multivalent binding. And that if you couple multiple copies of, let's say, receptors on a cell or an oligomeric receptor binding to um, multiple copies of a carbohydrate on another interface, you can get really uh, effective avidities. And one thing that this doesn't illustrate is that these interactions are kinetically labile. And so there's an advantage of having them be involved in cell-cell recognition in that if you start to have multiple interactions like this, they can easily, if they're the wrong cell or the wrong target, um, be disrupted. I want to point out um, a lesson that we really uh, learned about multivalent recognition early on. And that is um, one of the first problems I tackled as an assistant professor was the targeting of white cells to sites of tissue damage. And we were interested in this protein L-selectin that occurs on the lymphocyte surface, and it interacts with carbohydrates um, on the vascular endothelium. We were interested in this because obviously uncontrolled inflammation is not good. And so we wanted to really understand what was involved in this interaction and potentially inhibit it. So 
we were interested in what was the ligand for this protein. And this was the ligand that we started out uh, investigating. There was data in the literature suggesting this was important, but it didn't work uh, very well. It was, again, a millimolar inhibitor. And what had been shown is that actually sulfation of this um, mucin-like protein that uh, L-selectin is thought to recognize is really critical. And so we made um, a sulfated derivative. And that was threefold more active. And that was very depressing. Because as you can imagine, these are not very easy compounds to synthesize. And the difference here is threefold. right? So this is sort of 1 millimolar. This is 0.3 millimolar. So we wanted a way to actually make potent inhibitors that would mimic this multivalent binding. And so the way we um, thought about doing that is using a polymeric backbone. And our idea for a polymeric backbone took advantage of modern polymerization chemistry. There's a number of different kinds of polymerizations that allow you to actually control the length and structure and features of what you make. And that's what we used. And so I'll tell you a little bit about um, that. So I wanted to put this up um, because Bob Grubbs is a really, was a really good friend of mine. And I'm very, very sad to um, not have him anymore. And um, Dick Schrock is an excellent colleague. And I've worked with both of these people to make bioactive polymers. So here I show the chemistry of the ruthenium carbenes invented by the Grubbs lab. By the way, um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Bob. Uh, I spent a lot of time um, hiking with him. And so here he is with my daughter um, many years ago. So these polymers, the, these catalysts are unique because of the kinetics of polymerization. Of course, many of you have run and made an acrylamide gel. When you do that, there's an initiation step and a propagation step. Initiation is slow and propagation is fast, so you can't control what kind of polymer you make. In the case of these catalysts, initiation is rapid and propagation is slow, so you can control the polymers you make by just controlling the ratio of this catalyst to the monomer. So a 1 to 1 ratio, I make on average this 1 mer. A 1 to 10 ratio, on average, I make a 10 mer. So I can actually grow and ask what's important for uptake or binding. And so we use this to make polymers of different lengths. And also to uh, functionalize these polymers with many kinds of biological epitopes, we developed a strategy um, called post-polymerization modification that now many, many labs use, which involves uh, generating a reactive polymer that then can be further elaborated. And so you can uh, imagine here you can add any group that you want. Um, it's just a functionally simple way to make polymers that are comparable. right? So you can make one batch of one length and then just functionalize it and compare epitopes. So we did all this chemistry, and then we wanted to ask, do these glycopolymers mimic um, mucins? Do they, are they more potent as L-selectin ligands? So we uh, made these fairly complex polymers that have, again, this epitope linked to that backbone. And what we saw is, if we use this original ligand, we saw a potency of about threefold better than what it was. But if we use this sulfated derivative, the inhibitory potency was 30,000 times higher. This is not just an effect of anionic charge, because if you put um, this group at a different position, you didn't see that kind of enhancement. But this enhancement, in a way, doesn't make any sense. It's too much, right? Why would you go? I, I, you know, 10,000-fold, it, it, it's too much. I mean, it's cool when it's great, you know, but so we were trying to understand this. What would account for this dramatic increase in potency? 
And I just want to um, point out what we found, because I think it's pretty cool and can be further elaborated. So what we found was that the reason this was so potent is it was clustering the protein and activating ectodomain shedding. So it was activating a protease that was taking it off the surface of the cell. I just want to point out that this was 1998, like way before Protax. But that is essentially what these other strategies are doing, co-opting a protease to get a catalytic activity. And I'll just say that I think this is a really intriguing strategy that at the time we were doing it, it was hard to know and characterize what protease would be good to do this with. But I think this idea of using proteolytic activity to shave a molecule you don't want off the surface of the cell is powerful. Um, so the fact that we could activate a cellular process led me to think about some beautiful work that that had been done in the Schreiber lab, um, really just as I was leaving it. And in this case, they were um, trying to understand how these natural products could activate signaling. And they showed that this uh, compound, cyclosporin, um, acts as a molecular glue. And if you um, want to learn more about molecular glues, this is an excellent little overview of them. And there's also a recent article in uh, Chemical and Engineering News on the topic. It's a very exciting topic. And so Stuart um, and, and found that this basically these small molecules were gluing these proteins together. And then he and um, Jerry Crabtree exploited this by making bifunctional molecules. So we had a multivalent ligand that could activate a protease. These sorts of experiments were going on, showing you you could bring together proteins in new ways. And so this led us to think about the role of using these polymers to assemble signaling complexes. And we were really especially interested in exploring this idea of combinatorial signals. So that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk um, discussing. So here's the basic idea. Instead of using um, glues or bifunctional molecules that bring together two or three proteins in a cell in a ternary complex, we wanted to think about using these multivalent ligands as scaffolds to bring together different proteins. And we're especially interested in how carbohydrate binding proteins might modulate um, the signals in the immune system. And so we could use the unique recognition pro properties of polymers. And I want to point out, polymers have a lot of cool properties in terms of you know, where they go in physiologically, their pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Um, but we were especially interested in exploiting their recognition properties to, again, bring and assemble signaling complexes. And we thought we could, we really needed polymers because we could take advantage of avidity, right? Because if you um, have these sorts of weak carbohydrate interactions, you need avidity. Um, we could explore receptor clustering, both for signaling and for uptake and endocytosis. And we could explore combinatorial signaling. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we've utilized this polymer platform to look at these different kinds of processes. So. Um, Here's where I'm going to blow you away with my animations. I'm joking. Um, we were interested in this protein CD22. Um, and I think this is a really good example of how we can use these polymers. So CD22 
is known to be a protein that um, dampens immune responses. And actually, um, it's found on B cells as well as some other immune cells. But if you um, delete it, so um, deletion mouse um, has autoimmune conditions, and it binds to uh, sialic acid containing sugars, like many of the Siglecs. Um, it has a signaling domain that um, recruits a phosphatase. So basically, this phosphatase can dephosphorylate um, neighboring proteins. So in that way, you could imagine it dampening down immune responses that were initiated via receptor clustering and phosphorylation. And so the question we were interested in is um, how it functions, because it's known to bind to proteins on the on the surface of the cell, like transmembrane proteins. So it can bind in cis. And um, you could imagine that that's its major role, but we also thought it could bind in trans, potentially. So the trans binding was really interesting to us, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, the reason we were interested in binding in trans is because we wondered whether you could use this protein to achieve antigen-specific tolerization. So, for example, people that have certain diseases raise antibodies to self-antigens. And right now, many of the treatments involve just um, down-regulating immunity in general. And we thought it'd be interesting to try to downregulate immunity in an antigen-specific way to particular antigens. And so um, I'll just mention that um, B cells are your antibody-producing cells, and the way they become activated is through this kind of engagement. And um, their activation then can lead to upregulation of um, proteins and other activation signals that recruit T cells. And if your antigen has a peptide epitope, it can obviously be presented to the T cell receptor and activate T cell signaling. So we thought, we didn't know whether the way CD2 dampens signaling, the B cell receptor itself is glycosylated. So you could imagine that it binds to um, glycoproteins, including the B cell receptor, and that's how it downregulates um, signaling. Or you could imagine um, that it can bind simultaneously to um, antigens and cluster with the B cell receptor, and therefore change signaling. And so we thought, you know, we could use these polymers to distinguish between whether the interactions were in, in cis or in trans. And here's the model. If, it, if we add these polymers and everything is all already in, in cis, the polymers should activate signaling because they're clustering the B cell receptor. Whereas if they bring together these complexes, and that's um, what gives rise to CD22 activation or CD22 activity, we should see um, less of a signal. So we had a simple experimental test. So we made these polymers. Um, so we used um, DNP as our model antigen, so dinitrophenyl. Um, and then this is our CD22 ligand. And so we just made the following uh, polymers, a DNP homopolymer that only has this epitope, a CD22 homopolymer that only has this epitope, and then a mixed polymer. And when we treated um, cells with these different uh, polymers, what we saw is that we get robust activation. And we're monitoring activation by calcium flux. It's a very standard assay. So we see robust activation by the homopolymer, but decrease in signal from the copolymer. And we could show this by other measures um, as well. So it's not just um, 
having the CD22 homopolymer there. So if you mix the two and they're not covalently attached, you see the same activation signal, but the covalent attachment leads to attenuation. So this is, was exciting because it does suggest you can then downregulate antigen responses very selectively. And I'll just point out that um, the pulsin in the MAZI groups show that you can actually um, do this in an animal. So um, using, again, a couple, a year or so after we published this, they showed um, using actually uh, liposomes, you can influence immunity in an antigen-specific way. And they've continued to explore this uh, strategy. So this suggests that we can use this strategy to examine these signaling pathways. And I want to just point out that prior to this work, and even still now, some people have been trying to make carbohydrate vaccines using sialylated antigens. I don't think that that's a great idea because you're always then recruiting these tolerizing responses. The fact that um, cancer cells have aberrant sialylation, they can alter these pathways, um, and this provides a means to control autoimmunity. So I want to spend the next part of the talk talking about um, some recent data that actually complements the data I just showed you. So rather than down-regulating immune responses using this kind of idea of combinatorial signaling, I want to talk about augmenting immune responses. And um, this is work of uh, Valerie Lynch, Adele Gaba, collaboration with M.G. Finn and Jeremiah's lab, um, and then uh, Robert is in MG's lab, and Sachin has helped us as well. So this is our team. And what we wanted to do is then activate um, immune responses. And so um, I don't think I, there are so many people here that are looking at innovative ways of activating immunity, but I'll just point out that there are a lot of things that we'd like to be able to target with vaccines that we can't. And so really understanding how to alter, um, how to alter immune responses and augment immunity is something that um, is a really an, a frontier area. And the reason we especially were interested in this is because if you look at immune cells that give rise to immunity, they're covered in carbohydrate binding proteins. So basically, these proteins are presumably recognizing epitopes that are foreign, and it's a kind of innate immunity. They're internalizing these uh, foreign-looking carbohydrates for the adaptive immune system. So, we um, have a special interest in a lot of these different proteins. We had been studying them. I'm going to talk a lot about DC sign, but this protein is very, very similar to this protein called Langerin, and we have interest in many of these others as well. These lectins actually come with internal signaling domains that can recruit other signaling um, components. So, so why are we interested in this? Well, basically, as I said, if these are signaling um, and they're, they're recognizing um, what I would call weird sugars that we don't have, then they may be augmenting immunity in ways that, have, that are, is not well established. And so I showed you how they can contribute to decreasing immune signals. What if they augment immune signals and we can then capture that for controlling responses to um, antigens that, or foreign agents that we can't very well recognize? And so I'm going to um, talk a lot about um, trying to use this in cancer immunity, but I think it's a general 
strategy that one can think about. So the cells that we're going to target sit at the bridge between innate and adaptive immunity, um, the dendritic cells. And I'm just putting this up here because I know that there are a lot of chemists in the audience that don't think about this. And um, so I want to just give a little background. But these cells tend to just go ahead and, and when they're activated, they can just internalize and or destroy uh, pathogens. Um, this is your antibody and specific T cell responses. And as I said, dendritic cells sit in the center. And just a little history, they were first um, described by Paul Langerhans, and he thought that they were part of, they looked like almost like brain cells because of their structure, so he called them dendritic cells. But Ralph Steinman really, um, in 1973, identified dendritic cells and uh, attributed their role as immunological sensors. Um, Ralph won the Nobel Prize, I think it was in 2010, um, and he's notable in that he was one of the few people that's ever won the Nobel Prize posthumously. Um, it's not a posthumous prize, but he unfortunately died three days before they announced the prize. Um, so, what he showed us is that dendritic cells are critical immunological sensors. They can capture pathogens, internalize them. Um, once they take up pathogens, they migrate to the lymph nodes. Um, and um, so they start out as naive, and then they migrate. Um, and they can, again, give rise to different responses. They're our most potent or most prevalent antigen-presenting cell. They are um, the most effective. And they send signals. So in response to what antigens they encounter in the environment, they send signals that influence T cell responses. There's been a lot of interest in using dendritic cells as vehicles for anti-cancer vaccines. Um, Ralph himself was, had pancreatic cancer and was interested in doing this and, it, and thinks um, presumably maybe even extended his own life through this kind of strategy. But the idea is that you, um, you load uh, dendritic cells externally with uh, tumor antigens and then you put those back inside the individual. So there is an FDA-approved um, strategy, but there's um, a relatively poor T cell response. And since we know that dendritic cells give these instructions, um, and I point out here they can recognize a variety of different uh, agents and then influence by what cytokines they secrete, whether or not, for example, you get activation of NK cells or whether you get neutrophil mobilization, whether you get um, antibody responses or whether you get um, activation of killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. So we hypothesized that lectins, if they're the thing that is binding to a lot of these foreign agents that they might modulate these responses so you get particular cytokines produced. And so what we were interested in is this sort of response. And so we wanted to pick a lectin on the surface of the dendritic cells to target. And we chose to target a DC sign. We chose to target it because it had been involved in uh, viral capture, and we knew from the work of others that the antigens internalized by a DC sign are presented to the T cells. So it's involved in antigen presentation, and this is really uh, beautiful work from uh, Yvette Van Koik's lab, and we also had a lot of structural information on what DC sign looks like and how it recognizes its carbohydrate ligand from Kurt Drickemer's lab. 
By the way, I don't know that DC sign mediates the binding of all these different things, but it, it can. And so we thought it would be worth uh, an investigation. And as I said, we had been studying this protein for another reason. We had been studying it because it was implicated in HIV immune escape. Um, HIV can bind to DC sign and be taken up into dendritic cells, but it is capable of subverting standard immune responses. So we were interested in that part. So we had been studying and looking for lectins uh, or ligands for this lectin. And I'll just point out, these were known ligands when we started. Um, these are you know, some of the naturally occurring ligands. We were able to do a high throughput screen and actually find really potent small molecules. So I just point this out because it's cool that you can actually recognize a carbohydrate binding protein with something that looks like this. This looks pretty not carbohydrate E. Um, but the ligand I'm going to talk to you about is this one. And it's not that I don't like this one, but it is pretty hydrophobic and it's more complex to synthesize. And this one is super easy. And it has some unique properties that are beneficial that this one also has. So we wanted a scaffold to present, um, to present our ligands that could be amenable to adding tumor antigens. And we're, while our polymers are cool and we're interested in using them, we thought that we would team up with um, another lab, actually MG Finn's lab, to use virus-like particles. These particles are great scaffolds because they're, first of all, they're larger, and so they're more readily internalized. Secondly, they have really regular structures that promote very robust clustering of receptors, um, and they're very easy to make. Um, and the ones we use are derived from bacteriophages. So there are a number of VLPs. Um, I know David Liu's lab has been engineering uh, VLPs for other purposes. We use very simple ones that, as I said, are derived from bacteriophages. We thought that these would be good, um, again, because they're, they're, they also possess um, single-stranded RNA when you make them in this way. So these are derived from single-stranded RNA viruses. So even when you make them in E. coli, they package randomly single-stranded RNA. And that can activate um, TLR, tall-like receptor signaling. And so we thought that these are coming with an intrinsic innate immune signal, and then we're going to deliver another innate immune signal, and we can see what the consequences of that are. So just to show you what um, this particular, we've used uh, two different uh, bacteriophage um, VLPs. One is Q-beta, I'll tell you about that first, and then another one is PP7, I'll talk about that uh, later. But these have a regular structure and they're just covered with lysine residues, so we have sites where we can add our glycan ligands. So what we did was just very simple, um, we modified the surface with an azid, and then we clicked on either our uh, particular ligand here for DC sign or this trimanose, which more effectively mimics what might occur in nature. Um, and the other thing that we use is just um, as a dummy ligand, we just use uh, this uh, PE derivative. And so we made these virus-like particles that either had this trimanose or I'm going to call this man alone when it has this group on it. Okay, so it's the aromanoside. And so we looked at uptake and we could see, you know, they're all taken up. And we can inhibit the uptake at least partially with an anti-DC sign antibody. Um, and they go to the antigen presenting compartments. And so um, what we wanted to then ask is, 
you know, what happens? What, is the immune, what are the immune signals? What are the dendritic cell signals you get out when you treat them with these virus-like particles? And we knew we didn't want um, a, a response that was solely tuned to B cell production, because that's what a lot of these VLPs give rise to if they're not targeted to a particular site. And what we saw was actually a little bit surprising at first. We saw that the aromanocytes were different than any of these other particles that were also taken up in, into cells in terms of the cytokine profile they elicited. So first of all, IL-10 is a tolerizing cytokine, so we didn't want that, so that was good. But we saw that we could produce cytokines that are involved in immune activation and that we saw better results, that is more cytokine production, um, with the VLPs that had that aromanocyte on. And this is just more data of similar. Um, so we were excited um, by this. And we could you know, use RNA-seq to show that we were getting um, a response that is indicative of the response that others had identified as being useful in cancer. Um, and basically, we saw this sort of antiviral, anti-inflammatory response, which is, involves activation of the cytokines that lead to cytotoxic T cells and um, the kind of response you would want for a vaccine that works against cancer. So why, were the, why was this aromanocide uniquely activating? Well, we thought it's because, so I'll just point out that when, the cell, when these um, particles are taken up by cells, they go into the endosomes, which is an acidic environment. And these are all calcium-dependent carbohydrate-binding proteins. And in an acidic environment, this calcium is bound by acid residues. And when you start to protonate them, you're going to start to lose the calcium, and then you're going to lose carbohydrate binding. This, we think, just loses carbohydrate binding as this goes into the endosome. And I'll show you why we think that's significant in a second. But this one should maintain carbohydrate binding potentially because we know from work of others that there's a secondary binding site on DC sign that involves, um, it's a very hydrophobic arrow binding site. And this is presumably the site that our initial ligands that we found that were heterocyclic is targeting. So there are these two sites that a particle with this kind of epitope on it can occupy both of these sites. A particle with this epitope alone can only occupy the pH dependent site. And so we looked at the pH of the affinity of the different particles um, at different pH, and we saw that you know, these particles, whether they had um, the red aromanocyte or the triman in gray were the same. Um, in terms of affinity, but as we started to decrease the pH, we started to lose binding to the particles that lacked the aryl group. So we think that maintaining this pH in the endosome is actually, or maintaining binding to DC sign in the endosome allows DC sign to signal in concert with the TLR7 receptor. So this receptor is the receptor that detects single-stranded RNA and amplifies immune sig signals in these cells. And so this kind of binding, scaffolded binding, could actually maintain the signals. So we think that this co-engagement is really what's critical for the signaling. And so what we did next is just turn and ask, can we use this? in um, an anti-cancer model. And so the anti-cancer model we used is a B16 melanoma that has been uh, engineered to express this model cancer neoantigen ovalbumin. This is a commonly used model. 
And it's, a, as I said, it's a melanoma model. And it's used um, in immunotherapy because it's, it's not very uh, responsive to anti-PD-1 therapy. So if you're trying to get something better than PD-1, which um, many of you likely know that the Nobel Prize was given for this form of immunotherapy, where you um, have antibodies that block uh, PD-1 anti or PD-1 um, PD-1 receptor interactions because those actually tolerize tumors. Okay, so what we did was we were hoping um, we could take advantage of this sort of scaffold and present this phenylmanicide, which should facilitate uptake through DC sign. We have this encapsulated RNA that should act via the TLR7. And then we have um, these peptides, which should give rise to um, specific immune responses. And we loaded these with um, both uh, MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 peptides. I'll just show you um, the design in particular. So we have, um, we aren't using the whole protein OVA. We're using peptides that can be loaded into MHCs and presented to the T cells. And these are designed with cleavable linkers, so they'll be um, more effectively lo loaded. So here's what we saw. If you compare then the PE modified uh, virus-like particles to those um, modified with the aromanicide, you see the PE ones are not taken up very well by dendritic cells, but we see reasonable uptake of all of the other ones. And then we immunized mice with these different virus-like particles. We um, added anti-PD-1 as a stimulant, and um, we also used the adjuvant um, CGAMP, and you're going to hear Ling Yin Li give a talk later this year, and she's going to tell you all about um, why that's a useful sting agonist. So here's what we saw. We saw that all of the mice um, treated with the VLPs that have all of the right components, the epitopes, et cetera, all of those mice survived this challenge. Um, if you had only the mannose but not the relevant uh, peptide epitopes, you saw um, some minor response and only PE. So these are sort of responses due to just augmentation of the immune system. Um, and these are the naive animals, the, those treated only with these and not with any VLP. And the tumor volume scores um, with these results. We were really excited by this because VLPs um, with other epitopes that have targeted dendritic cells haven't gotten this kind of result. So we wanted to see whether these were um, specific to the peptides and what you can see um, in this assay, so we add um, the peptides to stimulate splenocytes, and then we monitor the production of um, different cytokines. And you can see here um, that stimulation with either OVA323 or OVA257. These are the two peptides we included on the VLPs. Um, only those, only this kind of um, only those uh, VLPs that had those peptides on them give rise to the response. So only uh, the treatment group that was with this VLP loaded with both of these um, gives rise to signals. So we know that we're activating against um, the cancer antigen, and we can show that uh, quantified here. And so we saw that you get um, specific activation of both CD4 positive T cells. These are important for augmenting and giving the signals for the CD8 positive T cells, so they work in concert to give rise to 
cellular immunity. So we saw, um, rel we saw as you would um, suspect, that only these, um, only the only the holistic particles gave rise to the desired responses, and the same for CD8 positive T cell responses. And then I'll just go quickly, because I know we're toward the end, but we also saw that um, this immunization protocol gave rise to antibodies that could specifically recognize the tumor cells. So we're really excited about this approach because we've shown now that we can use this kind of idea of scaffolds that can deliver these multiple signals and co-engage lectins along with other immune receptors can modulate the immune response. And I talked to you about attenuating it and then activating it. And I'll just point out that We've looked at one receptor, and there are a number of these receptors on the surface of immune cells that can modulate these activities. And so we think that this is a powerful strategy that hasn't been widely exploited to really influence immunity in a specific way. And it makes sense, right, that we would use combinatorial signals to regulate our responses, but using this sort of platform, we can dissect what those combinatorial signals are and how to then exploit them to give rise to the desired outcome. So thanks for listening. Um, as my daughter once said to me, you don't do any of the work. Um, these are the people that did all the work. I tried to highlight the people who did um, the work that I specifically talked about throughout the talk, but everybody in this group contributes their ideas and energy and excitement, and I am just so lucky to work with them. I want to um, thank my colleagues. I have so many collaborations since moving to MIT when Ron introduced the ecosystem, I cannot tell you how um, excited I am to be here. I neglected to um, mention uh, Dane Wittrup, who actually helped us with a lot of the animal work as well. I want to thank all these collaborators. I want to thank these people who funded the work, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Laura, for a wonderful talk. Um, we'll take questions. We'll, we'll put them on the microphone because people are on Zoom, so I'd like them to hear the questions as well. And I know that Laura would especially like to hear questions from trainees. Um, thank you, Professor. I, I was trying to think about why the acronym mammals work, like biologically. Is there any possibility that like mammals modify tyrosines and naturally like existed post um, transcript modification or something? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. So we don't have um, a lot of free mannose, or a lot of mannosylated glycans. So we use mannose as a core, and then it gets elaborated. So we, have, we take mannose, and then we put like different residues on. So that core is virtually always buried. Viruses, when they infect us, and Matt's lab has done some really beautiful work on this, when they infect us, they disrupt the proteostasis network. And so they often leave us with um, just mannose and mannosylated glycans on their surface. And so um, the receptors that we have that recognize mannose presumably can detect a lot of those viruses Yeast and fungal pathogens also put um, a lot of mannose on their surface and don't further elaborate it. So a lot of the things that we encounter that are not us do have a lot of mannose on. So yeah, thanks for asking. I should have mentioned that. All right, right we got one in the back. 
Hi, uh, great talk. I'm really curious about this mechanism of pH insensitivity of the mannose aryl ligand. Do you know for sure that it's um, causing the virus to stay stuck to the endosome, or is it also causing it to move out of the endosome, say, through the retrograde transport pathway? So we haven't, like, we haven't looked inside a cell at the details of the virus. We just know that it's pH-dependent binding. So we are in the process of trying to dissect like, exactly where, um, whether we get a coordinate binding in, in a cell. Mm -hmm. So good question. I don't, I don't think it's likely to shuttle it out. So I, I think it's, it's likely to either be bound or, or you know, start to dissociate. Um, so in the very beginning of your talk, you showed us um, these multivalent ligands and how um, just installing this um, sulfonate group, you increase the potency um, by 30,000 fold. Yes. Did that come at the cost of specificity? So, um, so we, I mean, we don't, we didn't detect so I would say we haven't looked broadly at specificity of those agents, but the mechanism, I think, is that we do, we have detected cleavage of L-selectin from the cell surface, and so you can um, detect that the free L-selectin, it gets chopped off. And so I don't think that it's going to lose specificity. There's not a lot of proteins that, you know, bind such highly sulfated things. Now, components may be of the coagulation cascade, but only when they're turned on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we didn't, we did, we did some animal studies and didn't see problems, so. Thank you. Hi, um, nice talk, thank you very much. Do you worry about the VRP possibly induce a cytokine storm? Because we know the immune system have to be very well balanced, but you use this wire like particulars, it's possible you induce a cytokine storm. So we haven't seen that, and I should just point out that these particles are not infectious. They don't have, they, don't have anything on them. They're really just the viral coat protein that's assembled. And so we haven't, I, I think that it's really unlikely that they don't have, for example, LPS. They don't have a lot of things in them that could induce that storm. Any more questions? Oh, great. Uh, really provocative talk. Um, so when you inject with, with the um, nanoparticles, uh, with this like virus-like uh, particles, um, are there a particular, um, is there a particular dis distribution to it? Because um, you know that, you know, Im immunity, particularly against cancer, is local, or it's more powerful when it's local, right? So is there any preferential distribution? So, um we're just looking at that. We, so far, we've only looked at the unmodified, the unmanosylated particles, um, but we found them in the lymph node. So, um, so the question of distribution is one that we're really interested in looking at. Um, I thought initially you were going to ask me about distribution of the mannose on the particles. So one other thing that I need to say, because I'm, you know, like that's my little chemical brain going, is that um, we have to use a really high concentration of mannose on the surface. And that's, I think, in part because we need to preserve the binding at that, that dual site binding. And so, but, but in terms of where the particles go, so far we've only, we've, we've mostly seen them in the lymph node. Yeah, and just a quick second question. Um, 
So this is sign, uh, I'm actually not sure about the expression of this on the CDCs that are known to really cross-present antigen. Um, and so do you, is there a way to preferentially really make sure that the CDCs, CDC1s, um, which are the ones that really do the cross-presentation, um, whether they're the ones that have been targeted preferentially? Yeah, so um, which dendritic cell populations are being targeted, we haven't looked at. But just on gene expression data, those do have DC sign at a reasonably high, you know, like RNA expression level. So we took a look at it. I, I think um, the other thing that I wanted to say in response is um, a lot of the kind of like the vaccines that we've seen that people have made, they actually inject at the tumor site. And we haven't done that. We just injected it. Um, hmm. And so we think that that actually is quite interesting that we see this robust of a response without sticking it in the tumor. When you inject, is it a single dose? Um, no, we did, we did priming. So we, we had, um, I think the dose was on there, but it's, I think, three. Valerie you, and Adele can correct me if I'm wrong. She says, I'm good. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to ask another chemistry question. Have you ever um, uh, optimized a linker like between carbon hydrogen and the mention of the polymers? Because I do know, like, for some uh, glyco, like polypeptide or like a polymers, the linker length might, might influence the binding of the receptor. Between. Yeah, it's a very good point. And we, um, in this case, we haven't looked at, you know, different lengths to see if we could optimize it further. We just looked that it worked and then just went with it because um, we wanted, like, really robust chemistry for attachment. But usually... Um, these, the good thing about carbohydrates, the good or bad thing, is the binding sites are super solvent exposed. And so you don't need a super long linker because you're not going into any deep pocket. They're kind of, I mean, it's a, the fact that they're so solvent exposed is a downside in terms of affinity, but an upside in terms of, of linker design. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, please join me in thanking Laura for a wonderful talk.